Got it. Thanks, Tyler. All right, last hit Duffy and Lopez had on Salcedo. He was deputy chief of security for the cartel. All right, so that much is true. Had a degree in engineering. Business license for a biodiesel factory that went belly up. Wonder why. Ex-military, served under a Carlo Cordova major, who became head of security for the cartel. That must have been how he got the job. Wonder if he clipped his old buddy to take his spot. And he was connected to the purchase of bombs in El Salvador and a plan to kill Pablo. Oh, just that? Does that sound like the everyman who only signed on to protect Miguel's family to you? OK, so he's a scumbag. Last I checked, he's our best bet to get Miguel. Scumbags I can handle. What I don't like are liars. So when he calls back with Miguel's location, how do you want to play it? If he calls at all, we ask the hard questions. See how he holds up. So excited to be here with Michael Stahl David, guys. Give him a round of applause. Here to talk about Narcos, Hi. Light of the Moon. So much to talk about. Uh, but Narcos is here, so we'll talk about that first, man. Were you a fan of the show before you joined up? Yeah, I had seen the show and liked it, but I hadn't watched that much of it. Um, and then, you know, once I found out, once I knew I was auditioning for it, I didn't want to watch it because I didn't want to get, like, you know. Uh, but then, uh, yeah, I remember I watched it all once I had gotten the part, and I was like, wow, I can't believe I'm going to be on this show. This is insane. Yeah. What did they give you as far as audition materials? Was it a script? Was it some idea of what the character was going to be? Yeah, we did a scene. Uh, one scene was, in, was, was an Agent Pena scene mm -hmm. in Spanish. So you you know you know Spanish right? Yeah, yeah. I, I went to a bilingual elementary school, um, sort of by luck and chance, and so I grew up speaking Spanish. Mm -hmm. So that was that that was an advantage for sure. And then um, and then the scene where we meet Salcedo for the first time mm -hmm. uh, was a version of that scene. Yeah. So you're reading with uh, Pedro Pascal, who is so fantastic in the show. Yeah, I mean the audition was literally I was doing a play. And I had like a 10 minute break in between a, a 12 hour day of rehearsal and just did it in my dressing room with my castmates. It was like kind of, uh, and it was all like on my iPhone and then did like a interview on my iPhone, like tried to hold it steady and not like <laughs> shake, you know. You didn't have one of those like uh, GoPro things or you got like, like a stick, like, yeah, exactly. stick. Yeah, I should have ran out to Times Square and grabbed one. Um, you no, know, did you, what did you do to prepare? I mean, obviously Chris Feisel is an actual guy. Yeah. He's an actual DEA agent. Um, what do you do to prepare for this? Yeah, so it was, I mean, one of the fun things about being an actor is every once in a while you get to really, like, peek into someone else's life. And uh, I was probably never going to end up uh, meeting a DEA agent, uh, you know. So Hopefully, unless, hopefully, hopefully right? in the right circumstances. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so I went to Arizona to meet with him, and he walked me through everything that really happened and what it was like, showed me all these old photos and... And the guy, I mean, I wish we had a photo of him. I mean, he looks like he looked like Kid Rock. Yeah. I mean, he had gotten like, to meet him as well. Yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah, he had like hair down to here. He was like working in Miami in the '80s, doing like undercover uh, buy bus, like so going to meet drug dealers to buy. Mm. And um, so you know, he he was used to kind of high pressure situations. And what he told me about working in Cali was, you just didn't know who was working for the cartel. Taxi drivers, police, military, and there was really no DEA office there. So they were kind of out of their territory in all ways. So it wasn't, um, it was, they had to be extremely careful and, and sort of like always doing counter espionage tactics, like always aware of who was watching them. They would pose as, as like German tourists and like hang out at this overlook where there was a, there's a photo in the opening credits of them standing in front of a building posing like tourists, but that was the building they suspected Miguel Rodriguez was living in. So that's how they got that photo. You know, so it's, it was an interesting um, hearing what it was like behind the scenes. Was there a particular story they told you that just gripped you and, and had you interested? Well, a funny story is um, Jorge was super scared and paranoid, you know, rightly so, to meet them. It was a huge risk for him to meet with them. And so he said, I don't want to see any Colombians. If I see anyone Colombian or anyone who even looks Colombian, mm. like the meeting's off. Because mm. um, you never knew who, if, what Colombians were working for the cartel at the time. And so he was like, yeah, I think when you see us, you won't be disappointed. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, and then apparently they get, off the, they get out of the car, they're meeting in this remote location. Mm. And you know, the first thing that Faisal says is like, hey, Jorge, are we American enough for you? <laughs> so that kind of broke the ice. That's so amazing. And you know, speaking of Cali and the Cali cartel, you guys actually you got to shoot in Colombia, correct? I mean, what was that experience yeah. like? 
I, that was the best part. Shooting in Colombia was an absolute dream, and it's now like basically I want it to be my second home. I mean, I, I fell in love with the country and the people, and um, it's so different now from what you see in the show. And it, I think it was like Lonely Planet 2016, number one place to travel. They've got beaches, rainforest. Cartagena and all these different beaches, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And so I was like, whenever we, whenever they're filming the scenes with like the Godfathers, I'm like off like running through the mountains or at the beach or something. Like I just really tried to get out and explore as much as I could and learn to dance salsa. I mean, people were very... Wait, you learned to dance salsa? Is that oh, yeah, saying? for sure. Yeah, yeah, what are your moves? What do you got? Do you, I mean, like... Yeah, absolutely want to see what's going on. No, you don't have to. You don't, like, you don't do have to. Right absolutely. Here we go. I mean, here we go. Like, it's just a basic... It's just a basic little... <laughs> it's it really feels awkward season. without music. <laughs> I feel like a real I wish weirdo. We had some salsa music. Give him a round of um, applause for that guy. The guy did the salsa for you. I'm such a show. If you off. don't watch Narcos after a guy dances salsa for you, then uh, I don't know what to say. Yeah, yeah. It, it was. I mean, you know, if yeah, I was there, so I had to do it. I mean, uh, and it was an amazing time to be there too, because they just had this historic peace process this year. Uh, ended a 52-year-long civil war. I mean, they had been negotiating for a while, so it had already things had calmed down. But so you see kind of a lot of young entrepreneurs, like, starting businesses. The art scene is exploding. The, like, you know, like there was, like, a TP hostel I went to, for instance, like, run by this young, cool guy. I mean, that kind of business mm -hmm. is, is popping up. So it's an exciting time in Colombia. Yeah. And, and Pedro was so good as Pena for the past two seasons and this season as well. I mean, what was it like working with him? What was it getting to know Pedro? Yeah. Well, he's the funny thing about him is he's so that like stoic, like tough guy. In the, the show, show, you guys don't get along at first. Oh, There's yeah, some animosity all. there. No, and he's got that like you know he's got that really kind of gritty and like you know stoic masculine thing. And in real life, he's very playful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's like cracking jokes like you know seconds before the take. So he was a lot of fun, and you know. Uh, you know, you're 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 kind of isolated, so you're out there, uh, far away from family and friends, and so you know you spend time together, hang out, and we uh, we got to know some locals, and who, that's the thing about uh, Colombians, they're very welcoming. So I remember this woman we met in Cali uh, was like, I want to take you guys to this my favorite empanada spot next to the river. Like I'll pick you up, takes us, drives us out to the countryside. We sit by the river, we're just talking about life. I mean, yeah, so it was we we had a lot of fun. Was it, what, did the locals have any stories about the Cali? Obviously, when you're shooting in Cali, the Cali cartel is still, you know, in in the zeitgeist there. Did they have any stories that they imparted to you while you guys were filming? I mean, more the thing that I would encounter was that people want to move on. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the people in Colombia are t kind of tired of this story. Mm -hmm. You know, they've they've been equated with. Escobar and cocaine for a long time. So, you know, for Colombians traveling abroad, it's like, oh, you're from Colombia, cocaine, oh, you do cocaine. It's like, and they're like, Ugh. <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, but we did hear some stories. And I mean, what's interesting is that one of the directors, Andy Bice, who's one of the executive producers as well, grew up in Cali during that era. And, you know, it was a, a a crazy time, but also an exciting time in a weird way because there was a tons of money flowing through. So there was all this. The development. dollar was almost like the Colombian peso was almost on pace with the dollar because there was so much money coming in. Correct? That was crazy. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a boom, an economic boom, and so there's a dark side to that. Obviously, that a lot of people suffered, and then there's other people who maybe didn't see that as much and saw, you know, that they were they had this and they felt protected. By, from Escobar. That was the funny thing. I mean, there was a kind of, uh, you know, the, the big Cali Godfathers thing. We protect you guys from Escobar, mm -hmm. which was part of how they kind of controlled, you know, and you couldn't speak out again. I mean, you couldn't go against him. Absolutely. Did Chris come to visit the set at all and see what you guys were doing? Yeah, he hung out. He came down to Cali, pointed out that the hotel that we were filming in, what used to be an abandoned field where they had met with Salcedo secretly, like the hotel. It's so room. surreal. That was kind of crazy. Um, and the funny thing was, you know, it's, there's a kind of, um, it's not easy for him to relax in Cali. You know what I mean? Like, we had a weekend, and I was like, oh, let's go out to the mountains. I met this great family. They're going to host us. We can have a barbecue. And he, as we're driving out of the mountains, that countryside outside of Cali, he's just quiet in the front seat, you know, just like white knuckling. I'm like, you doing you having a hard time relaxing, Chris? He's like, yeah, this is crazy. I can't believe they'll let you guys come out here. Because yeah. for him, I mean, it's still, he has all those memories. Um, 
So, but that also, you know, helped me remember just how real this was and, and the kind of, the kind of work it, like what it takes to be, I don't think I would be a good DEA agent, honestly. Uh, you know, you have to, the kind of tenacity it takes to sort of like, you know, for instance, do surveillance on a building like night after night, you know, for eight hours, I'd be like, where are these let's go salsa, yeah. you know? Come exactly. on, let's go. Um, has Chris seen the show so far? Did you get any uh, response from him? Yeah, Chris was super supportive. Yeah, always. And uh, was very, I think, very happy with the show. And, and you know, felt like ultimately the, you know, even though we, we do fictionalized stuff and this is not a documentary, that the main points are, are you know, are accurate. And, and I think he felt happy with it. Yeah. yeah, it's out there so people have seen it. Was there a favorite scene that you got to shoot? Is there a favorite action or, you know, espionage scene that you got to film? Well, one of my, I mean, espionage, I mean, there's a scene of me and my partner, uh, Van Ness, uh, played by Matt Whalen, and we're just, like, sitting outside, wa- like, staking out um, Hilberto's house, and... We just wanted to communicate like what that was actually like, which was like it could be boring. Mm. So we had they had us like improvise, and we did this stupid improv about like two guys talking about speed, the movie Speed, which probably came out around that time. Yeah. So it's, I don't think it, you might not even know. Felt really it's organic, feel real. Yeah, but we're just like, so yeah, this was sixty miles an hour. So you gotta yeah, you can't let her you gotta jump off the yeah. It's just like that kind. Of, then like all of a sudden goes into you know action mode when we see the guy, but. That yeah, was that's awesome. Um, now, as soon as the Narcos drops, people are always like, when's the next season? Would you be down for next season? Do you want to do another eight months in Columbia? I mean, I would absolutely, but I don't actually, I'm not going to be in the next season. And I think the show is going to see another reinvention. I mean, they reinvented it for season three, but they're going to reinvent it even more for season four. Yeah. So uh, I think no one exactly know. I mean, knows. I and mean, then they have a plan that they're not sharing exactly yet, I don't think. But it's going to be you interesting. You have the inside scoop for us right now? I mean, you know, I think I can say it's in Mexico. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and the filming starts soon. So, I mean, it's it's underway. So well, I'm excited. I know about that as yeah. much as, as I was with this one. Um, now we have another film that you, you just did, The Light of the Moon. Um, let's see a trailer of that first, and then we'll talk about that. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry that I wasn't with you, you know? If I've been there, Matt, then if please, I've been with you... Please, please, I don't know. Please. Sorry. What'd they say? It's not broken. It's good? Yeah. They gave me some stitches inside my mouth. Why have my cheek? We have your discharge papers. Great. So first, I have your pregnancy prophylaxis. I'm sorry, what is that? This is your morning after pill, just in case. These are all precautionary, Bonnie. The chances of anything happening are really slim. This is your HIV prophylaxis. You have to take this once a day for 28 days straight for it to be most effective. Now, I've also called you in some anti-nausea medication because this tends to make people feel a little sick. It could induce vomiting. But I'm going to give you your tetanus and hepatitis B vaccinations right now before you leave. The police have also asked if you could take them to the crime scene. When now? That's ridiculous. I mean... I I understand. The scene could become contaminated or disturbed. No, I'm not. I'm not going to go back there. The job on the fucking map. It's fine. It's up to her. Okay. Good. All right, Bonnie. uh, My card's in there. You can call me anytime. And there's some numbers for some free therapy services, too. One more quick job. Okay, all done. Let's get out of here. Such a powerful clip right there. Uh, Stephanie's performance is brilliant. Why don't you mind? Tell, do you mind telling us a little bit about what the film's about? Yeah, it's that's a um, it's a it's a it's a, a scene that is illustrated. Il- illustrative illustrative of the film but it's also like it's like a tough thing to just see that um but it's it's essentially about the aftermath of a sexual assault so you know a young successful architect is assaulted on her way home and it's about how that affects her relationship her life and how she tries basically essentially she tries to put it behind her and wants to return to normalcy quickly and it's about that not being as easy as she would like and you play her boyfriend, Matt, right, who, who finds out about this after he sort of went out with his friends or went out with some work colleagues um, right. to celebrate that night and wasn't around. Um, what about the script did you connect with and, and wanted to tell? Yeah. 
I mean, I felt like when I read the script, I was like, this is not a story I've ever seen before, which is it's not rape as um, a plot device or a revenge story or something to make the character seem like edgier and more interesting. It's about just what is the aftermath? What is that like? What is it like to have sex with your part with your boyfriend for the first time mm -hmm. after you've been assaulted? What's it like to if your boyfriend starts becoming the perfect boyfriend all of a sudden and giving you breakfast in bed and staying home from work and being there and it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Mm -hmm. What is this new version? I just want the regular, mm -hmm. you know, my life back. Mm -hmm. So it's about a couple navigating that. And it's about, you know, and I had never seen that before. So that felt really emotionally intelligent to me. And um, and just felt very, very honest. She had done a bunch of research and, and you know, this the, the writer directed this had happened to a friend of hers. So. And it, you know it happens to a lot of people and affects a lot of people, yeah. and you know and men are the ones doing it, for the most part. So it's also right now in this moment after Harvey Weinstein and everything, I think there's an opportunity for a conversation about okay, so what's going on with us, with guys in the culture? Um, is there something in our culture that says men have to be dominant, in control, strong, mm. and then that's also connected to violence? Mm. That's a lot of the ways we see dominance displayed and then we have we see that spilling over into you know into violence against women so how does that connect to just like sexism misogyny calling someone you know cat calling someone on the street all these like little m much smaller things but you know there was a scene that was cut where she gets cat called and it's sort of like you know there's a lot of guys would say like hey i'm being nice you know and some women occasionally you know might say hey th that was a nice interaction but a lot of times it's not and you don't know who you're talking to mm. when you when you call out someone on the street. You don't know what what they've been through, or you know you could be talking to someone who's a survivor of assault. So then, you know it, it it's kind of how do we as men sort of ask each other to think critically and sort of take a leadership role in saying, hey, you know that's not cool, yeah. which is not it's easy a, to do. Yeah, it's, it's great the lens is being pointed at it. Obviously, there was that video of the girl walking around New York City getting catcalled. Right, hello then, back, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, hello, cat callers, or that Instagram handle that was that was going on. Um, what did you? How was it to sit in those scenes? How was it to be around Stephanie when she's filming something like that? Obviously, that clip is is tough to watch, but I imagine it's tough to be on that set. And the whole film, I just want to be able to know the whole film is not that heavy. Mm -hmm. There are moments of levity in it, um, and also just more normalcy. And and it's not that. That's kind of one of the turning more, back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it was actually very satisfying filming this. I mean, Stephanie's incredible, first of all. I mean, she's so funny on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and then she comes into this film, and it's just an emotional powerhouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she was very easy to act with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the director gave us a lot of, you know, kind of space and time to make us, uh, for us to feel comfortable. And so I remember the first time we improvised one of the most dramatic scenes, just like, or sorry, rehearsed it. It was like, oh man, I wish we were rolling camera on that. I mean, it was just we had a we had a connection, a, a, a chemistry. So, um, so it was a real pleasure in that way. I mean, obviously, Narcos, this this movie. I mean, these these characters are different. The situations are different. The characters are different. What 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 are you connecting to uh, when you're? What are you looking for when you see a script? When you see a pilot? I mean, like the most basic answer of what I look to in a script is just something that's well written, mm -hmm. you know, and something where you feel like. Oh, this is a good story, a good storytelling. I mean, that's the baseline. Um, and the fact is, like, I'm not exactly in a place where I can be much more picky than that. If I get it, if something is compelling, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm throwing my hat in the ring. Yeah. Uh, we had Rob Reiner here recently, and uh, LBJ. Obviously, you were just in that. I mean, what was that experience like being on that kind of set? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's wild, you know, working with people who have that kind of legacy behind them, like Rob Reiner. I mean. Um, but, you know, you really just have the task at hand, which is the scene that you're shooting that day. Um, you know, for Bobby Kennedy, I had, um, like, these, these fake teeth that I would wear, these big, big teeth. I had con colored contacts, which kind of blur your vision in a weird way. Um, I had worked on this accent really hard for a while. So there were all these sort of little transformational things I was trying to do. And, and so... You know, in a way, there's a technical thing. And then there's also, but working with Woody, I mean, someone who uh, is, has so many years of experience. 
you know, and so playing off of him was was easy, and he was having a lot of fun in that role. I mean, he's very actually funny in the movie as LBJ. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, yeah. I mean, what is the experience? I mean, starting off with Cloverfield, that's almost like what ten years ago yeah, that man. that came out. That's old. crazy. Yeah. You come on, man. Um, but I feel like people watch that movie still all the time. It lives out there on the Netflix. It's, you still get a lot yeah. of people who uh, connect you to that film or see you in New York and wonder if they should be looking out for a monster <laughs> frozen down the streets or something. Yeah, I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's. It's definitely like a cult classic, you know, in some ways, and um, which is which is awesome. And uh, yeah, that was that was a really wild thing to happen. Like sort of early in my career, I was suddenly on this huge set, and uh, it was amazing. Um, and you know, I think also I just had someone say to me today that like, oh, we were all trying to figure out what that trailer was, and we we're online. I mean, J.J. Abrams really does know how to, you know get people curious. He's got another one coming out that people are really curious about, too. Yeah, he's a marketing genius. Yeah. Can you give us a, a slice of life on that? Sammy, TJ Miller, all you guys just sort oh, of firing it. on all levels. It's crazy. Yeah. You guys have both uh, you know, sort of risen up the ranks. Well, TJ's ab- an absolute maniac uh, in the best sense of the word. Uh, so he was always just, like, having us in stitches. Lizzie Kaplan, also hilarious. And But it was, like, a tough shoot. I mean, it was a lot of just running around. <laughs> Uh, your and cardio like pretending up. like you're about to die, basically. Uh, so like you know, jumping rope and just so that you were actually like breathing heavily and that kind of stuff. So you were off offset, jumping rope and yeah, coming I would back be on. Like, I would be like jumping rope before, you know, before. It's wondering how I mean. you were looking so exasperated. And TJ Absolutely. was like, "Yeah, <laughs> I'm behind the camera, so go screw yourself." Yeah, uh, that's amazing. Well, we have some audience questions, uh, so we're gonna start right there. So Carlos Munoz, I'm not sure if you've heard, he's been shot and killed in Mexico after he's been scouting for locations. And you've mentioned how Colombia feels like your second home. But when news like this come out, do you ever like stop and think like, wow, I'm, you know, involved with real world, like, you know, real deal stuff. And then it could be potentially dangerous. I know there was also a question about you guys uh, not filming in Mexico and going back to Colombia. So how is your team feeling about that? Well, I mean, and to be clear, I'm essentially not involved anymore with Narcos, but I did get that hear that news, of course, like everybody did, and was you know horrified, and it is really sobering. Um, you know, a scout has one of the most dangerous jobs on a film set because he's going to locations that are unsecured first, and um, that was a tragedy. So, you know, certainly, but that also doesn't, you know, and I don't, and I haven't explored Mexico in the same way that I've explored Colombia. Um, what I've experienced in Colombia is that I've definitely feel safe there. Although you also, you know, you 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 exercise common sense, but um, so yeah. yeah. Great answer. Uh, next question. Hey, um, so I remember you being in uh, the Black Donnellys a while back, uh, which I remember as being like the Irish Sopranos, which I loved. Uh, how did you get involved with that show, and what was it like working on it? Yeah. The Black Donnellys was my first job in television, like, before I even did Law & Order. It's a crazy first job to be working with Paul Haggis. Uh, Yeah, man. And uh, I replaced somebody last minute. So it was, like, very, it happened very fast. I was a pedicab driver at the time, like, bike taxi. So I rode my bike taxi to the audition. um, And, like, I was pretty green. In fact, there was a scene I remember where, like, Bobby Maresco, who was the co-creator with Paul Haggis, had one of the producers, uh, who was a woman, come and like, you know what, yeah, just go up there with him, go up there with him while we're doing the scene. And in the scene, there was a kiss. And so I was suddenly like, do you want me to, do you want me to kiss her? And they were like, no, absolutely not. And I was like, oh, okay, of course, sorry. <laughs> but it was also like, there was something, I think, innocent about that character, so it kind of worked. Uh, so... But I was trying to kiss producers. That's what you're saying. No, <laughs> right. Absolutely not. Um, no, that was a very green moment. But I just was literally like, uh, I'm what am I supposed to do? I'm not. Supposed, OK, cool. Um, but it was uh, it was certainly a learning experience to be on that show in a huge way. And were you still a petty gab driver after? Uh, doing yeah, that because show? I was, didn't took a while for the check to come through. So I was like I was like going from set to like, all right, well, better get back on the mic taxi. Hey, Paul, you need a ride to somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, one more question. Hi, Michael. Hi. Um, as someone who also loves to dance salsa, I'm wondering, you know, do you have a preference salsa on one, salsa on two, and what are some salsa artists that you like to listen to? Why weren't you up there salsaing uh, with them? Put on the music and I'll do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, 
The on two is the is that the Puerto Rican style? Isn't it on two? More Caribbean, yes. Yes, more Caribbean. Okay, so maybe not just Puerto Rican, but I think on one is what I do. Yeah, that's what I know how to do. Um, and artists, um, let's see. Uh, I just met Ruben Blades. He's dope. Um, oh man, there's uh, Grupo Nietzsche. That's like a big one. Yeah, so I'm, and, and the cool thing too about this was I've always kind of liked salsa music, but I didn't know it. So now I'm sort of getting to know which songs I like. Uh, there's like some Boogaloo All Stars or something that has a great couple of great songs. So, yeah, I mean it's it's still I'm still learning, but it's it's been super fun. And the cool thing about New York is there's tons of salsa stuff all summer. So there's like free events everywhere. Yeah. Well, if you guys want some great music, some great performances, Narcos is on Netflix right now, and then Light of the Moon is out November 1st, correct? November 1st at the IFC Theater. Come on down. It will not be as depressing as that clip was. And we'll be there uh, for a lot of the screenings, especially I'll be there November 1st and 2nd. I'd love to say hi and talk to you about what you think of the film and hear about it. Check it out, guys. Thanks so much for being here, Michael. Give him a round of applause, guys.